Okay, so our first step is to prepare our blanks. And I have a blank across here, and this blank needs to have the corners radius. And the first step to radiusing the corners is to snip a small amount off of each corner with our snips. Now, when I say a small amount, it's the uh, lab suggests an eighth an inch. The whole idea here is it's not a big amount, it's a small amount. You can always snip more off, but it's hard to snip more back on. So we're going to take a small amount off that corner, and you can see just a tiny, tiny little bit has come off that corner. I'm going to go ahead and do that to all of the corners. Once again, if in doubt, make the amount that you snip off the corner smaller, not bigger. Here's my original, and there is my corner snipped version. Now I need to file the corners. I usually go to the corner of a bench to round the corners, and I simply take my file, and all it takes is a couple of rounded strokes to round those corners. The difference between a well-rounded set of corners and a poorly rounded set of corners is the difference between something that's professional and something that's not professional. The next thing we're going to do while we've got the file is we are going to square off each edge. So I'm just simply going to run the file once across each side, and that gets rid of any burr that's on that side. Does not take long. Now I have a deburred and D-sharped cornered, if that's a word, piece of aluminum. This blank is ready to use. All right, so we have our big blank, and it's ready to use. It's going to sit across here, but we also need our small blank. And since this is a full-size set of plans, we don't actually have to measure on it. We're just simply going to put our piece across here and mark out where the small blank goes. There's a line on this side. Here's a line on this side. And now we can use a ruler or any straight edge and mark across here where our small blank gets cut. There we are. We're going to cut this. And it says to use a tin snips, but since we are in the sheet metal lab, we don't have to use tin snips. We've got uh, the big shear, so we're going to use the shear to cut this now. So we're over here at the stomp shear, and we're going to make our cut. The stomp shear is called the stomp shear because when you push on it, that brings the blade down. Uh, by the way, make sure your fingers are not anywhere near that blade when you push on it. We're going to push this piece into the stomp shear until we can see the piece until you can see our line show up right on the edge of the table. Make sure your fingers stay clear at all times. When the line is lined up with the edge of the table, we're ready to stomp on the stomp shear. First, the call comes down to hold the piece in place, and then the blade makes contact. It takes a pretty good amount of force, but that cuts our piece. Now I've gone ahead and I've rounded all the corners on the little piece. Didn't need to show you that because we already showed you rounding the corners. And I put a little tape on the blank that I've cut out. Now the reason I cut this blank out is because this is a full size plan. We don't need to do a bunch of measuring. All we really need to do is punch on the lines. So we've gone ahead and secured our paper template over the top of our main piece. Make sure it's nice and tight. You don't want the, everything to be loose. And now what we're going to do is use our automatic center punch to punch each of the spots. So everywhere that the lines come together, we're going to punch. All the way across here, all the way across these sets of lines, and in the little X's in the center, down through this set of lines, and all the way across. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to drill these holes. And when we drill them, everything in here is going to be drilled with a number 40 drill bit. Everything in this area is going to be drilled with a number 30 drill bit. And everything in on this line is going to be drilled with a number 21 drill bit. So everything up here is 40, 
30, 21. And then we come back again and we start with 40 on this next line. And then we go to 30 on the next line. So that's how we're going to do the drilling. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to remove the paper template, although if you prefer you can drill with the paper template in place, but the chips kind of get stuck underneath the paper. So we're going to remove the paper template and we're going to work. Later on we're going to transfer the holes from these sections onto here, but that's a separate step. Make sure that we do that properly when we get there. So I've checked my number 30 drill into the drill, and I'm going to go ahead and drill all the number 30 holes. The important thing about drilling those holes is getting that drill bit right on the divot from the center punch, holding the drill straight up and down, and then as I do my drilling, ensuring that nice chips come through. If I am making, uh, if I press too hard, I get uh, huge chunks coming out and it tears. If I don't press enough, I get nothing coming out. So I want a nice amount of drilling to come through and I also need to make sure that I hold the drill straight up and down this way and straight up and down this direction. So this takes a little bit of practice making sure everything is straight up and down. There we go. I also have a little bit of a bend on this particular drill bit but we can live with that. I'm gonna go ahead and drill all of these number three rivets which are the 4D drill bit. I also want you to notice that I have a block and I'm drilling onto the block and that's because I will be very angry if you drill onto my table. Don't do that. Use a block. I'm going to go ahead and drill all the number threes in this section and then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to drill the number threes down in this section because there's no reason to uh, um, change my drill bit more than I have to. So we're ready for our number four holes. That's going to be all these holes and all of these holes and we keep moving in exactly the same manner as we did with our number three holes. Sometimes it helps to manually start the drill with your fingers to uh, keep it from getting out of line. So I've drilled all my number three holes here and here. I've drilled my number four holes here and here and now I'm ready for my number five holes which are drilled with the number 21 drill bit. And there's only a few of those so it's not going to take us very long. Lovely. Now the next thing we have to do is remove all the little burrs from the edges of these holes. If you pass your fingers over them, you'll find lots of little sharp burrs. So wherever there's a little sharp burr, I need to cut that edge off. The best way to do this is simply to take a bigger drill bit and a quick little spin in your fingers over each hole will just slice that burr off. Now I don't want to go too far. If I go too far, I'll put a little chamfered edge around the hole. I don't want the little chamfered edge, I just want to cut the burr off. So I move across each of the holes. Now some people prefer to use a deburring tool and I have these dog leg deburrs and you can use them. They work a little differently. I set the, the uh, deburrer there and with a little flick of the wrist it'll deburr as well. One of the problems I tend to find with students who use these dog leg deburrs though is they tend to go too far and I end up with uh, little bevels on the edge of the holes instead of just cutting the uh, edges. That's why my preferred technique is still just to use the uh, drill bit. Run over each hole and once I'm done, and this is, we're going to do this on the front and on the back, although I'm not going to show it to you, and once it's done we'll be ready to start driving rivets. The proper length rivet to use is a rivet length that has one and a half to one and a quarter times the diameter of the rivet shank sticking out past the material before we bucket. So this happens to be a 3-3, 4 4 and 5-5. It just happened that way. It's not always going to be 3-3, 4 4 and 5-5. But those are the sizes we're going to use. And the first thing I need to do here is I need to clamp the rivet plate in the vise. I'm going to pad the jaws of the vise with blocks of wood to keep from damaging my rivet plate. Having secured the workpiece, I'm going to 
find the proper size rivet driver for whatever size rivet I'm going to work with. And I'm going to get my rivet gun out. The first time I use any air tool for the day, I want to put one drop of oil in that air tool. And we're going to verify the proper action of our rivet gun. Once again, using our wood block to make sure we don't damage my table. I'm going to set the strength of my rivet gun. That's about how strong I want this to be to drive number four rivets, which is what I'm going to start with and demonstrate on. I'll let you figure out number three and number five, but they're pretty much the same. My bucking bar goes in my left hand, and I'm going to squeeze the rivet between this bucking bar and this rivet gun. By putting the appropriate amount of force between these two, it's somewhere around 15 pounds of force, I'm going to go ahead and squeeze the rivet. And if you listen very carefully, you can even hear a difference in the rivet as it's driven. Kind of like listening to a, a glass of water when you fill it up from a faucet, how it changes tone. This will change tone as well. And now I've driven my rivet. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drive all my rivets across here. But let me show you what it looks like when it's properly driven. When it's properly driven, I should have a, a head that is about one and a half rivet diameters. And this should be about two-thirds of a rivet in height to three-quarters of a rivet in height. And that's an appropriately driven rivet right there. We're going to go ahead and drive all of our rivets, but I'm not going to show you all of the rivets because that would take forever. One thing I do need to warn you about, though, is don't drive rivets in these center ones. Those are for Cherry Max rivets on this project. Putting in a number three rivet is very similar, except it doesn't take as much work. It's really easy to overdrive these little number threes, and they go in real quick and easy by comparison. Of course, a little practice is good to put any of these in. For the number five rivet, I put my number five end on it, and it's gonna take a lot more force to rivet it. I'm not gonna turn up my rivet gun yet, because I want you to see how much more force it takes. But once again, we're going to go ahead and rivet this thing, and it's gonna take it a little while to flatten it. Still not enough. I don't think I've got enough strength here. I've gotta turn up my gun. Try that. Now we should be able to flatten this thing. That's good. So here we see the piece with all the universal head rivets driven. Still have room for our Cherry Max and still have room where we're going to put our plate. Cherry Max comes next. Cherry Max rivets are kept over here in this box and that's because these rivets cost somewhere around a penny a piece and these rivets cost somewhere around a dollar a piece so you have to talk to me to get these rivets you need to make sure that you're ready to install them the way we install these rivets is we use a puller ours happens to be a hand puller they do make power pullers we take the rivet and we put it inside the end of the puller and you'll notice that the stem from the last rivet falls out when we put the, the next rivet in this rivet goes through, and I have the number one rivet in place. It's going to go on the left side. I'm going to place it in position, push the rivet through the hole. It should go easily, but my drill bit's been giving me fits on this one. So there we are, all the way set in on the, the rivet hole. And I'm going to go ahead and squeeze with a number of squeezes. You're going to hear that bang. That's the rivet setting itself in position. And then the next one, it's going to break the rivet off. There we are, and our number one rivet is set. Now to use this machine, I need to get it ready to pull again, so I hit the release lever, and you'll hear a click as this thing shoots forward, and now we're ready for our next rivet. I'm gonna install two number one rivets, three number two rivets, and a number four rivet. And the reason I'm having you install these different rivets is because I want you to see what happens as different rivets are installed. Um, this particular piece is right between the grip rank length range on a number one and a number two, so they'll probably all install properly. Then I'm going to have you install a number four, and it's not going to install properly. But I want you to see what it looks like when things go wrong. So here's our, number, our second number one rivet. 
and this will just be a repeat of what we did before. There's the first click. There's the installed rivet. Click, and we're ready again. This time I'm going to go ahead and install the number four rivet. Here we are. Number four rivet slides into position. Pull it down. There's that click, and it all broke off all at once. And there's our number four rivet. And we'll talk about inspecting these rivets in, uh, in class. I can feel it's kind of rocking, and it's loose like a loose tooth. And that tells me that there's something wrong with it. I'm going to go ahead and install the number two rivets. They're just like this, so we don't need to watch the whole thing. So now we're ready to install the small plate across the front. And the issue with the small plate is we need these holes to match exactly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set this, place, this plate right where it goes. And then I'm going to drill a hole from back behind so that it exactly matches the hole that's already there. So I'm going to do this drill. I'm going to drill this spot in. And then I'm going to attach it. But I don't want to attach it permanently because I'm going to have to take it apart to deburr it. So I'm going to temporarily attach it with this Clico. A silver Clico fits a number three size rivet, which is drilled with a number 40 drill bit. Don't blame me. I wasn't the one who made up all these numbers. And that is a temporary fastener that fastens this in position. Two Clicos will keep it from sliding around, although I'll probably put about three on it. Notice I'm doing the one on the far side from where I did the first one. A silver Clico for a number three hole. And I've gone ahead and I've, I've, I've fastened this piece in position. I'm going to go ahead and drill the rest of the holes from the back side. And now I need to move to my number four rivets using my number 30 drill bit. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to drill this one in the center and Clico it there. You can never have too many Clicos. Clicos are our friend and they make things outright. So here we go, the rest of the holes. Keeping your drill parallel or uh, perpendicular from your workpiece. You'll notice because I've got my workpiece up at an angle so you can see it, that my drill's not straight up and down, it's straight up and down compared to the workpiece. If I have to drill from here, my drill is going to be at an angle like this. If I have to drill over here, it's going to come like this. Whatever it is, it stays perpendicular with the workpiece. Now, we've gone ahead and drilled all these holes and they match perfectly because of our Clecos, but we haven't deburred them and to deburr them we're going to have to disassemble. So we take the Clecos out and now we can disassemble the part. Whenever we disassemble a part we want to have a good way of making sure we can reassemble it in the same way that it came apart. On this particular one because of our green marker or our green uh, paint it's not hard to figure out how it came apart but if this were a different one I'd probably want to put a couple of little marks on it so I know exactly where these pieces fit against each other. Notice when I open this up, there's all kinds of chips in between here. And those have got to come out before we rivet it together. Otherwise, we're going to have all kinds of crap caught in the rivet joint. And we don't like crap in the rivet joint. We're going to go ahead and deburr each hole. And then we're going to reassemble this just like we had it before. So with my deburring done, now I'm going to reassemble the uh, joint using my Clecos, and I can Cleco from both sides. So there's my Cleco from this side, but since I'm going to be working on this side, I'm actually going to bring my Clecos in from the other side, and that's going to make it easier to work. And when you're doing your working, you can kind of plan which side is best to have your Clecos come from, as long as you have access to both sides. What we're going to do is we're going to install universal head rivets or flush head rivets across here and that means we're going to have to countersink and make everything fit properly. So if you're thinking to yourself, hey, that doesn't look like the project we've been working on, good observation. We never start countersinking without first setting up our tools on a piece of scrap. What I have here is a micro stop 
countersink. And I can tell which size I have by looking at the size of the pilot. It's going to be hard to see on the video, but this one is just big enough to fit a number four rivet, and this one is just big enough to fit a number three rivet. And these are going to carve the edge, the countersink, that the uh, rivet goes into. But I'm going to have to make sure that they're the proper depth. So they get chucked onto my drill. And then I hang on to them by hand and I feed that into the countersink hole. And I work in until it won't countersink anymore. Now, the next thing I need to do is grab my little rivet and I need to see, is my countersink the right amount or did I go too deep? Now, again, it's going to be hard to see, but I can see looking here that this is much, much too deep. I need to make this countersink shallower. To make it shallower, I come across, I lift this up, and I screw it out. Each of these little castellations here is worth a thousandth of an inch, which is why it's called a microstop. And now I'm going to try it again, and we're going to see how my rivet looks the second time. All right, that looks a lot closer from here. We'll see how it looks when the rivet goes in. And when I put the rivet in, oh, I can just catch my thumbnail on the edge. This is a little too shallow now. I need it in between those two. So this one was too big, this one was too small, and if we do it right, this one will be just right. Thanks, Goldilocks. Okay, so I need it to go down a little bit, so I'm going to screw backwards one click, two clicks. How about we try three thousands, three clicks. And here we are, ready for our try number three on our Microstop countersink. Grab our rivet, hold it up to the edge. I think we can still go another, uh, another click or two in. So we'll keep working on it. What we really want to do, one click, two click, there we are. We really want to make sure that it's flush, because that's the whole point of a flush rivet. So, last try. At least the last one I drilled a hole for, so I hope it's right. And yes, there it is. I can tell it's flush, it runs right across there. And I want this to be right at the surface, or it can be up to about two thousandths above the surface. But if you can catch your thumbnail on it, it's not flush. Number four is bigger than number three. And I have the holes all pre-drilled, ready for us to set that countersink up. And uh, this one also looks like it's set too aggressively. I can tell just by looking at it. So we're gonna shallow it up until it looks about right. That's a practice thing. And I'm gonna try making my holes. Here we go for countersink trial number one. Got to grab my rivet, hold it up, and it is perfect. Alright, we have our plate chucked up in the vise. I've still got the number four countersink ready to go, so we're going to go ahead and do our number four holes first. Have to skip the one with the Clico. But we need to do the one with the Clico, so I will move the Clico to one that I've already done. And now I can come back and get the one with the Clico. And now we want to switch to our number three. Grab our number three holes. You'll notice, you'll 
notice I use a slight rocking motion and that's to make sure I've reached the bottom all the way. You'll also notice that I keep my hand on here to keep it from spinning because if it spins I get much more crap on the paint. Move our Clecos again. There we are, prepped and ready for our flush rivets. Flush rivets are driven with a mushroom set. That's what it's called because it looks kind of like a mushroom. It has a different style spring and the whole thing screws onto our rivet gun, almost like anything else does. Of course we need air. And we need to set our power appropriately. In between is appropriate. Now, there's lots of different sizes of these mushroom sets. Use the biggest one that will fit your work because it's going to try and skate everywhere while we do our actual riveting and we want to do as little skating as possible. I'm gonna go ahead and hit a few of these rivets in. I'm starting with the number three so it's not gonna take very much to flatten it. Now, this particular rivet is a 3-4, and it's a 426, being, meaning it's a countersunk head. A 3-4, meaning it's one size longer than the 3-3s we drove on the other side. But that's because we're going through one more layer of metal. So we need a longer rivet. I'm going to go ahead and put as many of these flush rivets in as I can. And then I'm going to stop and move my Clecos. I've got three in that's good enough for that to stabilize that side with no Clecos. Clecos can come out. Additional rivets can go in. I personally like to kind of spread them out and not do them all in one area. I kind of work from one spot and then, then to a next spot and so on. Good. Good. The last of my number threes. Now I'm going to switch to my number fours. And I don't have to switch uh, ends this time when I switch to my number fours because flat is flat whether it's a number three or a number four or a number five. They'll all go into the same, with the same mushroom set. And I'll begin working my way across. Move that Clico. Somehow, you probably saw this long before I did, I'm missing a number three right there. Not anymore. There's all of our rivets driven, and the last thing we're going to have to do is remove the rivets as per the instructions, and we'll be done with this project. All right, the last thing I'm going to show you here is how to remove and replace defective rivets. Well, I guess you can do ones that aren't defective, too. We're going to remove this rivet, we're going to remove this rivet, and we're going to remove this rivet. And I just picked these, um, and I'll pick some for you to remove as well, but you also want to remove any defective ones and replace them before I grade them. So, how we remove the rivets depends on what exact rivet I have. All the ones I picked are number fours, you do the same thing for number threes and number fives, but I'm going to go ahead and show you number fours, just because that's what I'm going to show you. And it all uses the same size. First step to removing a universal head rivet is to center punch the head. So there we are. 
I've got a divot on the center of the head, and now I need to drill down through the center head of the rivet. The problem is, as I begin to drill down the center of the rivet, the drill bit will almost invariably skate one direction or the other direction, and I need to make absolutely certain that the drill bit stays on the center of that head. So I'm going to continuously look back and go, hmm, where am I compared to where I should be? I'm going to make sure that that drill bit is in, really in the center of the head of that rivet. The next thing that I need to do is I need to make sure I go the right depth with, these, with this drilling. If I go too deep, I'm going to start drilling into the base metal, and I don't want to drill into the base metal. I only want to drill through the head of the rivet. So I'm going to drill down into the rivet until I reach about the level of the base metal, and then I'm going to grab my center uh, or my pin punch. I'm not quite down far enough because it wouldn't grab a hold of it. And I also feel like I'm still off to the side, so I'm going to push it back towards the center and then come down into the rivet, and that should be good. Now I should be able to break the rivet off like this, break the head of the rivet off, and this should all be the same width. Now I'm going to support my work over here. And I'm going to tap the buck tail of the rivet out. And now I've removed my rivet. When I do this right, there is no damage to the base metal. The base metal is identical to what it was before. Now we have to talk about how to remove the Cherry Max rivet. The problem with the Cherry Max rivet over here is that the head of the Cherry Max rivet has this steel shank running right through the center. And since steel is hard and aluminum is soft, there's no way I can drill that Cherry Max rivet properly. So what I do before I drill the Cherry Max rivet is I grind down through the locking collar on the top of the head and then I drive the pin out. So I've got a little grinder here. Love the thing. We're going to very carefully, so as to grind only the head of the rivet and nothing else, we're going to grind down the first little bit on our rivet head and then we're going to come back and drive the pin. It doesn't take a lot of grinding, and I'm down below where the head is. Now, using a spring-loaded center punch or similar, I can punch the stem back and out. Now, I have a perfect hole right through the start of that rivet, and I can drill through this rivet and remove it, much like I remove the other rivet. So, we're going to drill a little ways down, and this one just fell out. Um, sometimes I have to actually drive it out. No damage to my hole. I'm in good shape. I've removed my Cherry Max rivet. The most difficult rivet to remove is the universal or the flush head rivet. And for my flush head rivet, once again, we're going to punch the center, and now we're going to drill down. But it's hard to know where to drill down to because we've got to drill down to the base of the bevel, but not into the base metal. So very similar to before, I'm going to begin drilling. I'm going to stop. I'm going to check to make sure I'm in the center. Lots of times. And I'm going to drill down until I reach the base of the head, but not below. Once I've reached the base of the head, but not below, I'm ready to tip that rivet out. There it comes. It's starting to tip out. There it is. I got it out. Now, I've got to tap it out again. Tap the, the bucked tail, is what it's called, out of that rivet. There it is, and I have removed, with no damage to the base metal, I've removed my universal head rivet. You're going to want to practice bucking rivets, and you're going to want to practice removing rivets before you begin working on your final project.